Welcome back to DBL. What happened to Teresa Holopa? That question has left investigators in Minnesota stumped for nearly four decades. Now, thanks to her high school reunion, investigators are taking another crack at the case. We have a look in today's DBL's Real Crime Mysteries. Teresa Holopa grew up in Tower, Minnesota, a tiny northwestern town with less than 500 people where everyone felt like family. It's her graduation picture. It was June 1979. Teresa had just graduated high school and was getting ready for a new adventure, joining the Army. We were like, yeah. what? <laughs> her last day in town, she left a family event early to go pack. When Teresa said she had to go, I told her to wait. But her brother was too late. By the time I got outside, she was already up the block. And that's the last I've seen her. <laughs> Ten agonizing days went by, but there was no sign of his sister. And then, police made a gruesome discovery. Teresa Holopa's body was found in the woods, beaten to death. Why? Why would someone do this? For an entire year, investigators had no leads. But then a suspect was identified. It was one of Teresa's classmates. But that small sense of closure lasted only seconds. They basically said that their prime suspect had taken his own life and that the case was going to be closed. I didn't feel they were giving us all the information. Why didn't investigators arrest him sooner? Was he the prime suspect? If he was, then why the hell wasn't he in jail? An investigation by CARE 11's reporter Danny Spiewak prompted investigators to talk. Why wasn't that person arrested at the, at the time? That person was interviewed, and I believe evidence was uh, being gathered was a uh, going to be going to a possibly a grand jury at that point in time. So this case was very close to being closed? That's what uh, my understanding from reading the reports, yes. Investigators believe the suspect took his own life after sexually assaulting a young girl. Teresa's case was suspended but it was never classified as solved. And nobody had looked at this investigation in about 38 years. That all changed this summer at a 40th year high school reunion when Teresa's classmates started asking questions. That prompted investigators to look at old evidence using new DNA technology. They think they have a good chance of finding something. Using uh, the technology that we now have that didn't exist back in 1979. This is now the second oldest active investigation in St. Louis County. I could use some closure. Is the pain going to go away? No. So what happened to Teresa Holopa? Joined now by our sister station CARES reporter, Danny Spiewak. Danny, thank you so much for being here. I want to just really commend you. You are the only reporter to cover this case in Minnesota. Danny, are there any new leads since you broke the story? Nothing yet. We haven't heard anything from the police department or the sheriff's office, but we have gotten a lot of emails and calls into our newsroom after running this story, mm -hmm. which is a good sign because it renewed some interest not only in northern Minnesota, but also here in the Twin Cities metro as well. That's very true. Hey, uh, Danny, we uh, we just watched the package and we just kind of want to know what were people saying at that high school reunion that grabbed so much attention from police? You know, it really started several months ago in the planning stages for the reunion as this 40th reunion was coming up. A lot of the classmates, I think just some of those feelings started to boil up from four decades ago and they wanted an official closed case here. They wanted to know what happened to Teresa because it was so traumatic 40 years ago, just days after graduation to lose one of their classmates uh, in a brutal murder, murder. They just wanted to know exactly what happened. They wanted an answer and they decided that maybe the reunion was the way to get the attention of law enforcement, which it turned out it was. Good for them. And this is such an interesting case. Teresa's family members told you they feel that other people are also responsible for her death. Why do you think they feel that way? I think they just think that it would be implausible for one person to commit the crime. It seemed in my conversations with them that they do believe that the suspect that was identified by law enforcement was indeed the person that committed the crime, but they just think that that person would have needed more help. They just don't think that that person would have been able to do it all alone. What kind of new technology would investigators be using to help find DNA evidence? And Danny, be honest, do you think that it'll work? 
You know, I, I think that it might, because in a lot of these old cases, they have DNA that was lying around, but back in 1979, they didn't know how to use it. They, they kept it thinking that maybe someday they'd be able to test it, and now they can do that. Mm. So if they do have any type of evidence from the crime scene still around, then I think it may give them a positive match on the suspect that they've identified. So it will be really interesting to, to just see what happens from here. Thank you, Danny. Yeah. And honestly, yeah. give yourself a pat on the back because you might give closure to a tremendous amount of people. You should be really proud of yourself. If you want to read more on the case, you can check mm -hmm. out CARE's coverage at care11.com. Thanks again, Danny. Really great job. Thank Thanks. you, Danny. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. We'll be right back.